All right, we're recording. All right, so David Desenza, CBCP, president of Desenza Business Continuity Solutions, has been involved in business continuity, continuity planning since 2009. He was the business continuity manager for the risk and information management group within American Express. His responsibilities included the development, maintenance, and testing of their business continuity plan. He was also responsible for creating the emergency communication strategy for the RIM organization. David works with companies to help them formulate plans they can implement when an unexpected business interruption occurs. He does this by helping his clients identify risks they have not mitigated, including determining the financial impact of a loss uh, of business functions, improving cybersecurity strategies and tactics, and prioritizing the order in which businesses, business functions need to be restored. Uh, and David is a certified business continuity planner by the Disaster Recovery Institute International. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to David. I'm going to go ahead and share his slides. Thanks very much, Zoe. I appreciate the introduction, and hopefully we'll get the slides up. I was supposed to be controlling the slides, but my computer, for some reason, uh, did not want to allow me to do that. So I'll be working with Hal a little bit later on after this uh, presentation to see if I can't straighten him out. Okay, so um, here we are in the midst of something that none of us have ever experienced before, certainly not I, um, and even though I have helped develop plans that have included plans for pandemics, uh, I have to tell you that um, I, like so many others, have really been caught off guard by, by what has happened. And um, that has created a great deal of uncertainty uh, in business, and uh, uncertainty in business is never a good thing. So what are the things that businesses need to do, be doing now to get their feet down onto the ground and continue on? Zoe, if you could uh, go to the next slide. So I had some assumptions uh, when I was putting this presentation together, and here they are. If you would go ahead and click. So I'm assuming that you've got a plan and you've activated it. And you are, you've got a team, and the team's meeting daily to evaluate the situation. And you've identified what your critical functions are in your business. And you've identified who the critical people are who are going to perform those functions. And you're reevaluating those last two points daily. However, <laughs> my assumptions could be wrong. And if those are incorrect, well, you're about six to eight weeks behind where you ought to be right now. But all isn't lost. There are still things that we can be doing to, uh, to get our businesses back up on their feet uh, and operating. So, first of all, Amy, if you'll go ahead. Or Zoe, I'm sorry. Yeah. So you need a team. There's got to be a team in place that's responsible for this, your crisis management team. And it should include the senior leaders of the organization, uh, what I'm calling your second tier, I guess we used to call that middle management, and your frontline leaders. I don't think you need to involve your CEO in this, although he or she may want to get involved. And the reason is that there may be an intimidation factor involved. Uh, we've seen it in meetings, haven't we, where people are concerned about speaking up when the CEO is president. Nobody likes to look dumb in front of the CEO. Uh, in on a team like this, there's going to be a lot of discussion and a lot of ideas thrown about, and you don't want anybody in that room who's going to squash that. 
You need your, your middle manager people because they've got a pulse on what's happening and your front line people who are, of course, in the trenches. Now, you may reconfigure this in, in different ways, but my recommendation is that at least those are the people that you need to have in the room. So what is this team doing on a daily basis? Go ahead, Zoe. All right. So your people down in the trenches, your line leaders, they're sending information up the chain, up to the next level of what the daily situation is. Go ahead. Those middle level people, they're using that information to make daily operational decisions that they are empowered to make and they're up uh, informing the executive teams of those decisions and passing that information on that needs to be acted on by the executive team. The executive team is making those strategic decisions and communicating them back down into the business. So as we know, information needs to flow up so decisions can flow down. The principle of subsidiarity needs to be at work here. That is, decisions are being made at the proper level. You don't want to be burdening your executives with decisions that could be made at, at a lower level. Let's go on. The next thing that you need to be doing is segmenting your work. You need to decide what the critical functions are that have to be performed if the business is going to survive. And how do you do that? You need information. And uh, that uh, is, uh, Zoe, is, is Amy Anderson on with us? I don't see her on the participant list unless she's one of the phone numbers that called in. Amy, if, if you're there, would you identify yourself? Seems like well, that. finance is going to be very helpful in, in, in helping to determine what are the, uh, the critical functions of, of the, uh, the organization. And um, they're going to provide that information. Uh, you need to know how often these critical functions are performed, whether it's daily, weekly, monthly, or annually. Right now, I wouldn't worry about annual work unless, of course, it's tax related, although uh, they have pushed out tax reporting into July. But uh, we may find ourselves there. Um, what are the risks that the business is willing to accept if these functions are delayed or not performed at all? And you need to think through those. Go ahead. Can they be performed on site or can you perform them remotely? And there are implications here. Uh, implications regarding the safety of workers who um, who have to report into work. And I know, uh, Wendy Lee, you asked me some questions about that, and I will get to that later on. Uh, can it be done remotely? Well, there are implications there, too. Does your IT network, or will your IT network, support a large number of people working from home? Is it robust enough to take all that traffic? Uh, do you have licenses for, uh, for everyone to install the proper software on their computers? Continue. Uh, go ahead, Zoe. You need to segment the workforce. Who are those critical people that must be present for the business to survive? And where are they? If they are off-site, or if they need to be on site to do their work, how are they getting into work? Are they using public transportation? I saw just this morning that uh, the Patco high speed line and uh, SEPTA are changing their schedules. They're not going to run as frequently. And they are running fewer trains, which I don't understand because that would mean people, uh, more people would be riding on fewer trains and, and you still need to 
uh, uh, have social distancing. So those are things which, uh, which you need to take into consideration. And again, like the, uh, the work, is it done daily, weekly, monthly, annually? Uh, you need to segment that out. Go ahead. And what happens if they're not there? What happens if they get sick? What happens if they are the only person who does this? Um, this is what we call a single point of failure. And uh, you certainly want to, to uh, find these now and uh, create an opportunity to cross-train people. Perhaps some people who have been um, identified as not being critical to the operation could be trained to be backups for these people. You also need backups up in your, uh, at your executive level. I saw that Fred Wilf was on here. Um, Fred, would you mind uh, unmuting yourself for a moment? I have a question for you. Sure, I'm here. Thank you, Fred. So I have heard stories of um, small companies, family owned, where the, uh, the founder of the company has retained uh, the power of signing checks to him or herself. And then that person has died, leaving the company in the lurch. What do companies need to look at to make certain that they are not in that situation? Oh, in that particular situation, they should have, uh, I mean, it's hard to anticipate that, that sort of thing happening, but it does happen all the time, unfortunately. Uh, and the banks, of course, are not in a position to accept a check with somebody else's signature. That's not been addressed. Uh, what it comes down to then is uh, a mad rush to figure out who's the executor and to uh, otherwise uh, set up a new process for the bank on very little notice. And hopefully, and hope that nothing falls between the cracks. Uh, the better approach, of course, is that for any small business, you do want to have multiple signatories on on accounts, as long as you have a second or third person that you can trust. Uh, and that could be uh, if you have uh, two or three people in a business, or in the case of a uh, uh, a person, a one person business, maybe it's a a spouse or a, or a trusted relative. Um, but that's thing to anticipate ahead of time, and that's exactly why, you know, this goes exactly back to David's point. I'll head back to you, David. Thank you, Fred. Appreciate it. Okay, and um, Zoe? And again, do they have to be on site? Can they work remotely? And again, I've, I've raised those issues. Um, if they have to be on site, how are you going to protect them. If they can be off-site, do you have systems in place that are going to support that work? You need to be communicating frequently with everybody in the company. There should be a company-wide update on a daily basis. Even if all you're saying is there's been no change uh, since yesterday, people need the reassurance that that there are people in charge and that uh, problems are being addressed and handled. Um, if you could go on. So, as I've listed here, you want to let people know what decisions have been made, what decisions are still pending. You want to share any successes. You also want to acknowledge any problems and, and what are being done to address those problems. Um, you also need to quell any rumors. And God, we know that uh, there have been rumors generated by this, uh, by this pandemic. You know, all the way from that there will be a national lockdown with the National Guard patrolling streets to... Uh, this has really been a, uh, a bioengineered attack on the United States, um, you know, and I'm sure that there are probably rumors floating around within companies. They need to be acknowledged and addressed and killed as quickly as possible. Again, for the purpose of maintaining the morale of the people who are working, this is a very unsettling time for people. And 
if you need people to be on their A game in your business at this time, you need to be addressing any rumors. There's something else that you need to face the possibility of, and that is that, uh, go ahead, Zoe, that somebody in the company is going to contract the virus or worse. And how will you address that? You need to think that through and be ready to deal with it when it happens. I was telling people beforehand, I was telling uh, Bob Jarvis before we began, my wife got notified yesterday that her admin has tested positive for the, uh, for the virus. That concerned the two of us because my wife uh, has been working from home for the past two weeks. And fortunately for us, um, we didn't have to go into quarantine because it was 14 days. Uh, uh, the, my wife hadn't seen her admin for 14 days. So we, we were put into quarantine at three o'clock and released at five o'clock. So it was a pretty short quarantine for us. But that news is going to spread in the company, and uh, you need to be prepared to deal with it. And God forbid somebody die from it. You need to be ready to address that. Let's go on, Zoe. All right, I want to uh, take a few moments here about uh, talking about risk management. And unfortunately, risk management has become... Uh, a dirty term in a lot of companies. They don't really want to uh, to deal with it or acknowledge it. Um, they will give it to one person. They'll put in some kinds of controls, maybe the three layers of defense to prevent risk. Um, this is a model that's been developed by a fellow uh, named Horst Simon. You can find Horst up on LinkedIn, uh, I'm not going to say too much about this because uh, this could be a presentation in and of itself. But this is a model, a management model that, that Horst has developed that um, is far more holistic than any other that I have seen. And it rests on uh, good sources of risk intelligence a risk, what he calls a risk nervous system, that is a, a means within the company of distributing this information and people who've got the competencies and skills to act on that knowledge. Horst's position is that no one is responsible for risk management in the, in the company because everyone is responsible. There's no one person who's got that uh, burden on their shoulder. Everyone is responsible. Uh, this model requires situational awareness. Well, that comes from your risk intelligence system. Mental simulation, thinking through the possibilities of a, uh, 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 what a, a particular uh, situation would present to a company, like a pandemic. Um, it uses naturalistic decision making. Uh, again, this would take a long time to explain, but it is the natural process by which we, we, we formulate our decisions. And then executing and responding to um, those decisions that, that are made. I would really strongly recommend you go out onto LinkedIn. You look up Horst. Uh, he has a great deal of information out there on this. Uh, it is a model that I think makes a great deal of sense and certainly should be in place uh, in a situation like we now find ourselves in. Okay, continue on please uh, there, Zoe. All right, uh, Wendy, this one is for you. You do need to protect your workers on site. There isn't too much that I can add uh, to what the CDC, FEMA, and OSHA are already saying that we should continue practicing social distancing everywhere in the company. That's in the lunchroom, that's in the bathrooms, that's in the offices. Um, you know, this, uh, this virus is not like 
a science fiction monster. It doesn't move by itself. It spreads because we move and spread it. And the less movement we have, the less chance there is to spread it. We should have, if, if it's available, hand sanitizer, sanitizers, paper towels. I know, I have gone out to the, the three um, pharmacies around here and they laugh at me when I ask about hand sanitizers. You know, there's a plenty of information out there on the, uh, on the interweb about how to make your own san hand sanitizer. Boy, I'm having trouble with that word. Um, using uh, aloe and um, isopropyl alcohol. If it comes down to that, there are recipes out there for it. Uh, you know, you should make this stuff available near commonly touched items like, um, go ahead, Zoe, uh, door handles and elevator buttons and toilet handles. Uh, anywhere where, where more than one person is, is going to be um, touching, there should be um, uh, some cleaner. Joe Maggot here is saying for surfaces, diluted Clorox solution can be used. We'll get back to that in a minute. Um, go ahead, Zoe. Uh, and as I mentioned before, this is a great time to, uh, to cross-train employees to prevent any single points of failure within your organization. Uh, if you've got, and as I mentioned, if there are any idle workers, this is a great time to, uh, to give them uh, another skill that they can use in their job. Um, it's also an opportunity for you as a business leader to uh, develop your bench strength to make certain that there are people who can take over from you if need be. Let's go on. Okay, so we are in a war. We are fighting an unseen enemy. And things are changing on a daily basis just as in a war. You know, we've, we are, are all recall that saying of, of some field marshal that um, battle plans change the moment that the enemy is engaged. Go ahead, Zoe. So we've got to review all of our previous decisions as new information comes in and make changes as necessary. We also have to remember that just as in a war, um, this causes a certain degree of discomfort for people. And we need, we, we need to be taking that into consideration as we, make, uh, as we make these decisions. That's why I say you need to communicate to your, uh, to your people on a daily basis and let them know that um, there is their, the problems are being handled as best as they can. Let's continue. Now, this might sound a little crazy, but now is the time to start thinking about recovering your business. We are a long way away from everything that I have seen from the peak of this um, uh, pandemic in this country. Um, and that means. Uh, we are going to be operating under these conditions for quite some time. So the thing to do right now is to start documenting all these decisions that are being made at all levels of the organization. Get a notebook into the hand of everybody who's got a leadership responsibility and tell them, record what you're doing on a daily basis so that when we get through this, and we will get through this, when we do our after action report, we're going to have material that we can go back to and from that start crafting our business continuity plan that we will have in place when the next disruptive event occurs. Go ahead, Zoe. Okay, so I said keep a diary. Think strategically about how your business will be different and 
it will be different when we come out of this. For example, go ahead. We might be elim eliminating certain products and services that we have discovered that are um, really do not make money for the organization. I have a client up in New York City. They had 1 million SKUs. And they've realized that a, a large percentage of those are one-offs. They're eliminating them. We might find that we can introduce new products and services. You know, we all know that a, um, a disruptive event not only offers challenges, but it also offers opportunities. And maybe there are new products and services that we can offer our clients as a result of this event. Um, is work from home going to continue? If it is, how is that going to change your organization? Um, think about this for a moment. If more people are working from home, do you need as much space as you currently are occupying? If not, perhaps you can consolidate some things. But what do you need for a network in order to support that? And how are you going to keep people who work from home feeling connected to the organization? We're already seeing people being very inventive by holding cocktail hours on Zoom after work. Uh, what other things could be done to keep people who may permanently now work from home connected to the organization? Here's something you also need to be thinking about. Will you be bringing back all your staff? Do you need to? And how are you going to handle that when you recover the operation and, and return back to the new normal? I want to say something here about cyber vigilance. Uh, we have probably already seen the stories out there about increased attacks using uh, this pandemic as an attack vector um, into companies. This is uh, a screenshot from an email that I got letting me know, thanking me for purchasing coronavirus insurance plan from Cigna. I did no such thing. This is phony. There are a couple of ways you can tell that it's phony. Um, one is, look at that second se sentence there. Please locate your account invoice statement in the URL under. We wouldn't say under, we would say below. Somebody who has a passing knowledge of English clearly wrote this. Now, did I click on the link? No, I have no idea where it would take me or what it would put on my computer. And that's the more important thing. Phishing emails are still the prime way that the bad guys get into companies. And you may say, well, my company's too small. And that's true. It may be a small company, but you may do work for a much larger company, and that's what they're looking for. That's how the bad guys got into Target. They went in through a, uh, um, an HVAC a contractor out in Western Pennsylvania who had very, very poor cyber hygiene. And as a result, they were able to get in, find the passwords that would let them into the back door of Target's um, IT network. So please, please maintain your cyber vigilance at this time because uh, they are out there and they are trying to take advantage of the situation. Lastly, if you go on, you need to take care of yourself because you are not them. You need to make certain that you're getting your rest. You need to make certain that you're eating properly. You need to unplug from the news media. You need to take a break. Turn the reins over to somebody else for a while. This is a great opportunity, as I mentioned before, to develop some bench strength in your team. If you don't take care of yourself, who 
will then be taking care of you and who will be taking care of the business. This is a very stressful time for people. And um, you know, none of you, I'm sure, are a strange visitor from another planet. Um, we're human and we need to look after ourselves mentally and physically. Okay, if you continue on, these are some resources that uh, I rely on. Uh, they're not going to be up here long. Don't worry about it. Zoe is going to send you an email with a Word document attached that has these links on them. Um, I'm looking every day at uh, the CDC, at FEMA, uh, the Johns Hopkins Center uh, keeps a dashboard up that tells us how many uh, uh, infections are, are out there. The, uh, the number, the United States, by the way, now leads the world in a uh, number of confirmed infections. Uh, when I looked at it this morning, it was 85,000. Uh, I am pretty confident that by the end of the day today, it'll be up to 100,000. And uh, if we go to the next one, uh, here's um, a source that I look at for information on the supply chain. Uh, I didn't even touch on that. That's a whole other area that needs to be looked at. And um, if we were doing that, I would certainly defer to my friend Newell, who um, I believe, Newell, I think you're still on, um, about what needs to be done regarding supply chains. So last slide, I want to leave you with this. We should always end with some um, encouraging words. And I was looking for something from our leadership, but unfortunately, I had to go back several decades to find some that um, I think need to be heard at this time, because we have all heard about um, people panic buying and behaving in ways that uh, uh, show the uh, the degree of fear that is out there and. Uh, the worst fear is, uh, is fear itself, uh, which paralyzes action. And um, there isn't the need for that at this time. We need to think through the actions that will keep our businesses operating and our people employed. And uh, working together in teams I believe that we can do that. So I've rambled on here for 44 minutes. Uh, it's time to open this up for questions. See a question from Newell. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask it? Sure. Thanks, David. Uh, appreciate this presentation. One question kind of goes to your last point. How, when you're dealing with a client, do you uh, get them to kind of take a balanced approach, putting an appropriate amount of resources into continuity planning and preparation without uh, kind of choking themselves or twisting themselves in knots too bad? Boy, uh, at this time, <laughs> that's really tough. Um, I have a client up in New York City. I just acquired them at the beginning of February before all of this started really to, uh, to develop. And um, they had nothing in place. And we worked very hard trying to outrace a tsunami. Um, operating under the assumption that they were going to lose access to their place of business and people were going to have to work from home and that quite possibly they might be um, uh, losing people as well in case anybody uh, developed the, uh, the virus and the fear that that might generate. We focused only on those things and we documented every decision that uh, that has been made. Um, we're not going to do any other work together until this pandemic has passed. 
then we're going to do our, our after action to refine the plans on what we will do if we lose those two assets again, and then start looking at the other issues or um, the other threats that the business might face. But for right now, we were focused on, on what was right in front of us. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, mostly. I, I guess, you know, the, the kind of my experience has been that companies, and, and particularly given the current environment, companies are either at one extreme or the other. We're not going to do anything about, particularly small companies, I should say, the kind that I normally work with. We're, we're not going to waste any resources preparing for a problem or we're going to absolutely panic and throw caution to the wind and just, just do crazy things. Yeah, I have heard that before. You know what, Dave? We'll worry about that when it happens. That is the wrong answer. You know, the time to learn how to recover an airplane from a spin is not when you're in a spin. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you want to learn that with your flight instructor. <laughs> you want someone there who's done it several times, who can take over from you when, you know, when you do it wrong the first time. Um, you know, we're fighting human nature on this because, um, you know, people just don't like to plan. You know, and, and I hear it from people from all quarters. Bill Borton uh, reminds me that, uh, Dave, they don't want to hear from us until they need us. They don't want to hear from us before then. So um, I, uh, I hear what you're saying, Newell. Um, they just don't want to think about it until they have to think about it. Uh, there's a question here from, from Bob Merkel about the likelihood that the um, uh, the identity of critical people and processes will change as the disruption lengthens. Yeah, it's probably going to change. That's why uh, flexibility is uh, required in this. That's why the team needs to meet daily and review its previous decisions because it may turn out that uh, a decision uh, has to be changed on, uh, on newer information. Uh, whenever I develop a plan for clients, I remind them I'm not creating the, a cookbook for them. I'm creating a guidebook. Nothing substitutes for good, sound business decisions. And that what we have documented might change because there's no way that we can uh, foresee every possible um, situation that might arise in a uh, uh, in a disruption and um, Joe thank you very much for that diluted Clorox solution can and should be used for cleaning surfaces because that virus uh, according to a study done by the um, I can't remember who it was by, but it was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine, tells us that that will, um, it can live for 24 hours on cardboard on up to 72 hours on a plastic or stainless steel surface. Interestingly, only four hours on, uh, on a copper surface. I don't know why that is. Um, but there was also uh, something from the CDC recently that cruise ship, the SS Minnow, I guess it was. Yeah, well, that's uh, it forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it. Um, oh, I like the background. Boy, you've got a great place okay, to work, work from home. Uh, yeah. I've been changing it just to you know change it up. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> um, they went in there, the CDC went in there, and they found virus in, uh, in the cabin 17 days after the last person left. So there's a wide variation on how long this virus can exist out in the, uh, out in the wild. And that's why it's very important that we 
we follow the social distancing and the shelter in place rules because we move the virus. It doesn't move by itself. Yeah. Uh, a few thoughts, if you don't mind. Uh, first, there's a, a video out there of a physician from um, Michigan, I think, with the uh, uh, decontamination uh, process for your groceries. So you should uh, Google that. Um, and uh, I, I just, you know, I think there's probably three sort of categories of companies out there. They're the ones who are prepared, the ones who, you know, um, you and, and Noah were just talking about that weren't prepared at all. And there's probably a middle group of, they weren't necessarily uh, uh, prepared because they prepared um, intentionally, but they were lucky. They had some people working from home and they sort of were kind of set up and, and they were able to transition without, you know, huge problems just because they got lucky. Um, so I would think that the, that the first and third have an opportunity now to spend some time on scenario planning and looking at the opportunities, not just the challenges. Uh, also making sure, as you said, you know, that clear who your critical people, because people are going to go down, right? Um, people are going to get sick. Uh, it may not be now, it may be later. It could be four months, five months, seven months, eight months down the road. Um, and it may not be the, you know, the, you know, if, we, if we're successful in flattening the wave, but people are still going to get sick. So, you know, figuring that stuff out is clearly very important. Um, and I think a lot of companies are going to need facilitation help to do this work. It's just not what they do on a regular basis. And just having somebody from outside the company go, hey, I don't know anything about your company, but I know how processes work. And, and no. you for somebody like yourself, um, you know, I've done a lot of facilitation of past. This is, you know, um, the stuff you do is not my expertise, but I can facilitate. So just being able to run people through the process of, you know, what what do you do? What did you do before? How's that got to change? What are you going to do now? You know, what opportunities are out there? How do you take advantage of them? Who do you need? What do you have to do? Just working step by step through all those things mm -hmm. is probably very valuable. Yeah. You know, the work that I do is not rocket science. Um, it's not brain yeah, surgery. But, and yeah, and I know that because that. I've, I've seen brain surgery. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but, Companies are not willing to allocate that resource internally. Right. And if they haven't done it before, it's going to take them longer. That's where, you know, where I can help. I can, I, I can help speed up the process. But I personally believe I've only got a four to eight month window. Once all of this, we get past the bolus of this event to really capture people's attention because you know, let's face it, Sandy happened and companies were disrupted and they still don't have plans. Yep. You know, this will never happen again. Oh, well, yeah. good good luck with that thinking. Um, right. I think that, it's... That particular one won't happen, but something else will. Yeah, something else will. You know, maybe we will get the dread zombie <laughs> apocalypse. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. You know? Yeah. There will be storms. There will be there will be things that will happen. Um, hopefully, we won't have another nationwide uh, thing like this again for a long time. No. Well, it's not only nationwide. Well, it's yeah, worldwide. It's worldwide. Yeah. Okay. Are Are there any other questions or comments? Agent Observations. Agent oh, AJ. Hi. I can't hear you. Sorry. I don't know what's going on with your. AJ, are you muted? Can you use sign language? <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad because I, I can't read it. <laughs> or if you want to type your question in the chat. Technology is wonderful when it works. AJ, you may have the wrong microphone. Uh, oh. back, so it may, it may be confusing. The way that Zoom works is that it assumes one microphone and it might have found a different microphone on your system. But yeah, go ahead and, and type it in and, and we can see what you're, you're, you're asking. If you click on the up arrow next to the microphone icon in the, in the bottom, yeah. left, and then see oh. what it's selected. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. we yeah. can yeah. hear you now. Yeah, so it, was just unplugged. It, was, it was just unplugging and replugging back again, which is the uh, solution for any IT problem. <laughs> <laughs> Reboot. So, all right, so two, uh, yeah, it's a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions, kind of more tactical questions, right? 
You mentioned, um, you know, critical functions and uh, you mentioned financial planning or help from finance department. Do you know of any planning templates, finance, financial planning templates that help companies, small companies come up with critical action plans around like, what are the top metrics you should be looking at? That's my first yeah. question. Uh, short answer. No, I don't. That's why mm. I was hoping that uh, Amy Anderson would be on because um, mm -hmm. I did want to ask her that question. I use a tool called a, bis uh, a business impact analysis mm. uh, in which uh, we go department by department and function by function within that department and ask at what point will the loss of this function uh, impact the, uh, the organization? Is it four hours? Is it eight? Is it 24? Um, right. And uh, I'm sure that there are financial um, reports that uh, we could also be looking at that would give us information about what are the, the, the critical functions? What contributes most to the organization? Right. You, know, you know, we'll probably find it. It's the old Pareto principle that 80% of the, uh, uh, the impact to the organization comes from 20% of, of what the business does. You know? right. And if that's the case, what are those 20%? What needs to be preserved and right. functioning now? Yeah. What would be useful would be some kind of a model, some kind of financial model that would say, here's the here's the five things you need to look at when this happens, because these are the most critical, I mean, that impact your no. cash flow and, you know, things like that. The other question is around the legal framework. And uh, this is, you know, plays on Newell's point about doing too much or too little. Is there a legal obligation for employers other than following the, um, you know, requirements, whether you can stay open or not, are there legal, are there legal requirements for what you have to do while you have employees on site? Like, um, best well, practice is not to get sued. Yeah, that's a very broad question. I mean, is that in terms of uh, contractual agreements with, uh, with unions? Is that in terms of contractual agreements with customers? Uh, is that in terms of service level agreements that vendors might have uh, mm -hmm. with you or that you have as a vendor? Um, that's not an easy que question to answer. Mm. Uh, yeah. You know, and all of those need to be taken into consideration when you're doing this planning. That's right. why, you know, people think that this is an easy thing to do, but, you know, you have to realize we're talking about uh, you know, unless it's a really small company, we're talking about a Swiss watch here, right? Mm. There are a lot of small moving parts that all contribute to the whole. And what are they? And how do they, uh, uh, how do they impact the organization? And uh, how do things that are outside the organization, uh, you know, like your supply chain, how does that impact um, you know, right now we're hearing that China is reopening. Well, that's wonderful. But there's, uh, we're going to have difficulty shipping stuff from China because uh, shipping containers aren't available. Ports here in the United States are shut down because what? People are, are, are home. They're sheltering in place. So, um there's no easy answer to that question, AJ. Thank you. Um, Bob Jarvis has a question. It was actually less a question, uh, David, but just want to thank you. I thought it was a very worthwhile, informative presentation. I was thinking about things I hadn't had to think about before, so I just wanted to thank you for sharing your expertise with the group. Oh, thanks, Bob. I appreciate it. If I may, this is Newell, if I can jump in with something, just kind of a takeoff on what AJ brought up. Um, and I don't know whether this goes to contingency planning or this specific set of circumstances we're under right now, but one of the challenges I've found with a couple of clients is how to keep on top of the state and local um, 
emergency regulations versus guidelines. In some cases, localities are actually enforcing things, and in other cases, they're just guidelines in terms of what you do or don't have to do in a workplace. And it's been difficult keeping up with that because it's been an hour by hour kind of a thing. So in, in one case with one client, I wasn't even sure where to help them look for information. Yeah. Um, one good source is the National Business Emergency Operations Center um, that's operated by FEMA. So if you... Google FEMA slash NBEOC. That is a source for information. Um, individual states are also operating their emergency operation centers. Uh, so that is another place that I would look um, for that. And, and you're right, Newell, uh, this is very fluid. Things are changing sometimes on an hourly basis. Um, and, and keeping up really is tough. Somebody needs to be dedicated to doing just that in the organization. Um, Mahendra sent me a, um, a, a message here, and for some reason, I'm not able to respond to it. Um, you're welcome, Mahendra. Thank you very much for attending. I, I hope you found it useful. Any other questions from anyone? Okay, so here's what I want everyone to do. At the end of today, I want you to unplug from the news media. We know things are going to get worse. We know that. Can you control it? No, you can only control what you do, which is social distance, shelter in place, wash your hands. Um, tomorrow, go on YouTube and start looking up the Saturday morning cartoons you watched as a kid. Don't watch the news. Watch cartoons. Get out an old Abbott and Costello movie. There are young people who have no idea who that is. Um, or the Marx Brothers or the Three Stooges. Um, something, anything. Take your mind off this. It's not going to go away. It'll be here when, when you get back. But take some time for yourself and, um, and renew yourself by um, getting away from this. It, I, believe me, I take my own advice. It's time for another Beacon Leaders Minute. 